You're very welcome. Bye. My next guest has just returned from his new home, Russia, a country at the centre of global tension in recent days. He was at the heart of the former Fianna Fáil government where he held three ministerial posts, the most recent of which being Minister of State for Science and Technology. Since leaving office in 2011, he's lived in Moscow where he has mixed with oligarchs and the elite alike to carve out a burgeoning business career. Would you welcome, please, Conor Lenahan, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Moscow, of all places. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all over the news, clearly, for, for obvious reasons. Is it a tense place to be these days, or is it, uh, is it on a high alert, or where is it at? It's not a tense place to is be, to be quite honest. It's a huge, huge city. It's the biggest city in Europe, 15 million people in the city itself, 35 million. Sure. I think, understandably, a lot of Russians are nervous, very, very nervous about yeah. what's happening. They've had a terrible experience in history as a people of war, the yeah. Second World War. Sure. They gave the most people in terms of deaths and lost people. And then, obviously, more recently, the Afghan war cut a huge scar through the whole society. So yes. They're the last people in the world who want a war. And they really are, frankly, asking the question, where is this going? They're, mm -hmm. they're very worried. Mm -hmm. and Understandably so. Yeah, on certain times, to say the least. Uh, what are you doing over there, by the way? I, mean, I mentioned business and oligarchs and so on. What, 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 what I, has I you over there? I work at a thing called the Skolkova Foundation, okay. which is a project set up and established by the Russian government, federal government. It's a 10 billion project aimed at inculcating or creating a culture of entrepreneurship, startup uh, business in a science city of 30,000 people on the edge of Moscow, okay. on the equivalent of their M50, if you like, orbital robe, uh, road. There's about 31,000 people who live there. MIT are delivering a research university at the site. In fact, some Irish people are involved okay. there. John Hegarty, the former uh, provost of Trinity College, is advising the, the MIT team on how to promote this university. Okay. So it's kind of science and technology, which would have been part of your portfolio in a previous life. And you're lending exactly. those skills to that I'm to endeavour. I'm doing very similar things okay. to what I was doing in the ministry. Uh, typically, when I was in the Science, Technology, Innovation sure. Ministry here, one would work with the IDA, pitching to the IBM, to the big companies. So you know what bring, you're doing. To bring that... research or shared services to Ireland. So it's a similar thing. That's why you uh, got the job, I take it. Well, those skills and the fact that Prior to my career in politics, I had been involved in business with Dennis O'Brien for 10 years yes. and had worked in his commercial operations. So how did this particular job come about? Where did it come from? Well, it's a kind of funny story. Yeah, I, just, I was travelling around the world after the election. I, I had this faint suspicion that I wasn't going to get the kind of welcome I got here tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, that there wouldn't be too much sympathy for Fianna Fáil ministers after the last election. So I sort of hightailed it out of the country, met a lot of contacts and friends, did some business in Nigeria. And in fact, the first offer I got was from a company called San Leon Energy, who are a very successful Irish company, doing something that I understand is slightly unpopular here, but it's called fracking. They have huge okay. acreage in Poland. They offered me a job as a director on their Polish board. And then after that, I got this call from a friend, a Ukrainian friend, actually, yes. who's a, a large businessman in the United States, a very successful businessman. He said, I've met some people in Moscow and they seem to be looking for somebody and you seem to fit the description. Okay. So. The next minute I was on a plane to meet uh, Victor Vexelberg, who's a wealthy Russian He's a billionaire, billionaire oligarch-type figure. Where did you go and meet him? Met, went to meet him in Rome, of all places, because both of us were busy. His diary probably, I suspect, was busier than mine, mm -hmm. given that I'd lost the seat and the yeah. job. But uh, we kind of coordinated our movements and met up in Rome. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. Um, what was he I doing did, there? What? What was he doing there? He was over there, actually, to... Um, show his collection of Fabergé eggs. He bought this collection. There's nine Fabergé eggs, but it's a total collection of 120 pieces. Right. A lot of religious uh, iconography. So that's why he was showing it in the Vatican Museum. Yes. Which, uh, you know, a lot well, of it's indicative of where he's coming from in terms of his collection. It's Fabergé eggs. That's what his yeah, sidebar I, is. Yeah, so, yeah. That, well, he, he did that and he's, he's made that contribution to the Russian state. Sure, the, sure. He doesn't own them himself yeah. now. He paid, but it's he his. paid the money, 50 of course, million. Of course. But he, he's donated it to the Russian state and it tours around the world. So, so. you're there, you're in Moscow now, Connor. You're living there full time, obviously. Um, uh, are there perks to the job? I mean, do you, do you have a. Is, is a good life? It is a good life. It's a lot of travel. I mean, I'm on and off planes. I spend a lot of time on planes going around the world, meeting people, chief executives of mm -hmm. large technology companies, yeah. or their head of R&D, or their chief technology officers, and try to mm -hmm. persuade them to locate in our research location. And I believe you're chauffeur-driven in Moscow, is that right? Ah, is that, is that well, part yeah, of the gig? It, it was, it certainly is part of the gig, yeah, yes. It's attractive. Yeah. 
Well, she's attractive, of yeah. course. Is and it? downtime in, in Moscow, what do you do to chill out? And well, relax? I have a lot of good friends there. I've made some very, very good uh, Russian friends. And there's a, lot, there's a few good Irish people there yeah. as well. There's some very well, Irish literature and Russian literature aren't a million miles apart. Well, yeah, they? that's the thing that, that I found very interesting. As I kind of read myself into Russia, you realise there's huge similarities. You know, yeah. when you talk about 19th century literature, yes. you know, Turgenev, uh, Chekhov and these people, this short story, they're great masters of the short story. Mm -hmm. And the Irish are renowned, obviously, as well in that same period. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, there have a lot of similarities in the history, too. I don't like pushing that too much. Sometimes politicians or even ex-politicians go on about similarities between countries. Yeah. But it's a very large country, very different to Ireland, but very similar experiences. I'd argue, you know, when we talk about our own experience of conquest, colonisation, the famine, mm. you know, it's, it's a sad history in some ways for Ireland, but I think the Russian history is even sadder again because the last 150 years has been, you know, a very ruthless Tsarist regime mm. that was very repressive. They experienced serfdom right up to the 1860s, you know, then the Soviet thing. So the, it's a very damaged society in sure. some ways. You know? on, 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 the, in the, on the cusp of emergence, you could argue. Let's, let's talk about you yeah, for a okay. minute, a minute yeah. or two, because you would have, uh, we would have seen you, I suppose, in the public light in some respect uh, when your father, the late uh, Brian Lennon Sr., ran for the presidency uh, of Ireland. And it was, it was uh, ultimately a doomed uh, experience. But uh, a difficult one for the family, I suspect. Yeah, it was a bit difficult and sort of slightly heartrending time. I think probably more difficult for actually the ordinary Fianna Fáil activists up and down the yeah. country because they had a huge regard for nothing we didn't, but yeah. a lot of them felt it a lot more and, and they showed great loyalty. Did you have to a him. good relationship with your dad or was he a, yeah, was he a yeah. political absentee father? He, he was an absentee father. It was always a great fear of mine when I went into politics first that, that I... I wouldn't become the same thing. But in fairness to my father, I became rather friendly with him when I was in college, actually, up the road here in UCT, because he, he was in opposition. He had no driver. So I was the driver. And I liked, you know, I really got to know my so father. You had your uses, Connor. So, huh? You had your uses, I had in my other words. uses, yeah. exactly. But, but from my point of view, it was very important because, you know, we're spending three or four yeah. hours. In yeah. those days, the roads were not as good as the yeah. ones we built. Oh, uh, well, you're taking the crowd here. Oh, you're taking the crowd here. Okay, we don't <laughs> It wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. Well, we'll talk about but, that in a moment. But, I wanna, I wanna but just, anyway, no, the point I'd say yeah. is that, you know, the political life is very hard. I'm not saying I'm making some special case for myself or my own family. Yeah. But, it, you know, I think people are a bit unfair sometimes to politicians, including the current people that are there. That They make big sacrifices in their family. And I only really got to know my father in on that. those drives. Let's, let's in, take a flavour of, of, of the presidential campaign. Just a, a brief moment yeah. here that people will okay. remember. Well, I want to say that I'm absolutely certain on mature recollection at this stage that I did not ring President Hillary. And I want to put my reputation on the line in that respect. May and Bua Agianosha. Obeg. 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 Oh, God. Oh, God. Elaine, don't tell shit. I have no plans to resign. I'm going ahead with my presidential Would you be campaign. willing to resign for the sake of the that, government? That is a no speculation. Way. Oh, hey. But would you resign, Tony? Yeah, he was kind of hounded and he was an architect of some of his own of downfall course, in, of course. in some respect. Was it but just from a son watching a father? I know it was, was very, that, it was that it was hard. very upsetting at the time, yeah. It I must think have so. been. Yeah, it was. I suppose I was younger, not as hardened as I know I'm after 14 years yeah. in the doll, but uh, was he a yeah. broken was he a broken man, do you think? He wasn't actually. And, wasn't and the interesting thing, just to kind of let people know this, that often when people spend all their time in government, they think there's nothing else you can do. Mm. But there are plenty of other things you can do. He mm. was a backbencher. He had a very important role in the early phase of the peace process with Albert right. Reynolds. so he had a role in At that. At the time, the government couldn't actually... There was a rule that the government ministers couldn't meet with members of the IRA, mm -hmm. or indeed Sinn Féin, and he actually fulfilled a role which to him was very satisfying that he couldn't have accomplished if he were still a minister, well, because he was a backbencher, he could go and meet, and actually met on one occasion, I think, with the uh, Army Council of the area to explain the Downing Street Declaration and yeah. the content. And I think for him, the last few years is like as a backbencher were very, very fulfilling. Yeah. You know? for, what about the, the your relationship as a, on your own as a man yourself with with Hawhey, Charles Hawhey, and the way he treated your father in, in towards the end of days, uh, politically at least, uh, not to mention the, this idea of the, the, the liver transplant your mm -hmm. father had, that money was raised, and there's yeah. questions over where all that money ended up. Uh, hard, any hard feelings in that regard at all, no, or, or very not, one of uh, not, uh, forgiveness no. and peace in the yeah, valley? Yeah, yeah, but my own father was very professional that way, that what, while he was professionally involved with Mr High and a very good friend of his from the 1960s onwards, yeah. he was very professional about his, his, his life and career in politics, and he remained 
remained friendly with Mr. Hoy even after this famous incident that yeah. occurred uh, in the presidential election. I think, you know, he didn't hold grudges. And there's not much point holding grudges in the political life, you, you know, because, you know, everything comes around eventually. You you know, are, you, if you go around nursing grudges, it doesn't get you very far no. in politics. That's my yeah, own Yeah, no, I appreciate that. He kind of, I suppose, instilled, instilled that into us as well. You were elected in 97. Yeah. Uh, and you'd served, was it 14 years? 14 in years, House. yeah. Um, I some would have thought it was madness to get involved in, the, in a family business like that, but Gene, you went and you had your aunt, Mary Rourke, was there, and your brother, Brian Lennon Jr., was there. Did you, were you close to Brian? I was, yeah. Yeah, he was my older brother, as yeah. you can imagine. There's four years between us. But and would he have called on you uh, in, in, when he was going through the, 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 that, that, that uh, awful time for, for the country? Uh, were you of assistance yeah, to him? Or yeah, in I was, what way? I was very involved because, because I, I was a minister in the government, obviously serving alongside him. Uh, quite often I'd meet him and, you know, go around to his office or he'd ask for some advice. And one of the advice I gave him, which was kind of interesting at the time, because... You know, politically, we were going down the tubes as a party uh, and as a government and a lot of people... And as a country. And yes, and, and people were saying that we're not seeing leadership from the government and, you know, the communications wasn't the best from the top of, of the party and the, and the leadership in the country. And I remember sitting down in August before this famous guarantee and all these things, and I said, look, you're going to have to communicate. The normal rules when you go into the Department of Finance is very conservative communication, minimalist communication. I said, this is a massive crisis affecting ordinary people. You've got to go out there. And that's why he took the advice in Finistrum and went out and started doing live interviews. He didn't entirely trust journalists and the media on recorded uh, interviews that could be changed yeah. and because of the, the, the scene was so delicately balanced at the financial picture, etc. Did he neglect to share some of the details with his own ministers who, who ultimately ended up going I, I, out telling people I, I'm not sure everything about was that. okay? I'm, I'm not sure about that, to be quite honest yeah, with you. I it think was quite mad at the end, wasn't it? It was it? a little bit mad at the end, to be, yeah. to be honest with you about that. And I, I think mean, people, what were you watching? To be what honest was... with you, I lost confidence in my own government. Did and you? I think, well, you, you know, I came out and I asked for yeah. the tissue to resign. I felt very... And again, going back to something I said earlier, you know, the, when people look at people like myself when I was in politics, they look at us because we're professional, we're paid mm. to be in this role. But, you know, the people who really keep parties on the road are those activists who were out from a father in the presidential. Yeah. And they were being let down as well. And that's important because they're voluntary, they're giving their time, they're not getting paid, and they're getting all the abuse. They get more abuse than politicians. Well, it's funny, they're you, they, in the community day in, day out, and people are teasing them, you know. So, did you, know. you hear the documentary uh, that was done that you featured strongly in on, on Radio 1 where you... you oh, yes, yeah, yes. Where, yes, yes. Yes, it yeah. went door to door. I remember driving and listening to the, to, the, yes. to the actuality of you canvassing. Yes, yes. Uh, this was at the, for the last election, obviously. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, it was unrelenting, unrelenting I, I mean, I have hostility. a clip of it I'd like to share. Oh, please, please. Because I think what it does is it illustrates two things. One, the life of the politician in one sense, and two, the anger in this country towards Fianna Fáil. Oh, absolutely. In this huge, case, you. Huge, huge anger, yeah. But, but again, I would say it's, yeah, not, you it's, not it typical, it's not typical of most people's attitude to politicians. In no, fact, but, but, it was an exceptional and very difficult and still a very difficult time here in Ireland. Yeah, let's but have a listen to it. people and, are quite courteous you, as we go around the doorstep. Yeah, yeah, but this, this was quite striking. Have a listen to this from yeah, the documentary. Yeah, really, look over here. Is it? Yeah, you can look One of Connor's canvassers had placed a leaflet through a letterbox. A man then chases out of the house. He squares up to the canvasser, eyeball to eyeball. Come on, come on. Come on, then. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Your brother's ruining this country. Yeah. Your brother's ruining this country. We're entitled to canvas and you. Entitled to canvas. Yeah. Goodbye now. Anyway. Goodbye. Fucking scum. Listen, watch your language. Fucking scum. You were here. You're you're a good example of civility and manners here. Yeah. What? What? How does it feel hearing that back now? Because it was it was full on. It was full on, but look. People were angry and they had good reason to be angry. You yeah. know, we, we had a, a tremendous boom years and certain irresponsible things were done in terms of spending, the property, the bank lending. And, and, what, you know, what about and, the... People were brought in a racing car boom, you know, and it's very like mm. a, I would compare it to a situation where you're in a car with somebody and the brakes sudden, you're going at speed and suddenly the brakes are put on for no reason. Yeah. You know, people were justifiably angry because they'd, they'd been expecting things to continue but as they were. But you built the car, you see, this is the that's difficulty. That's right, oh, no, 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 I'm not I, trying I, to I, minimize I, that no, at I know, all. But I suppose no. in terms of, of where, the, where people always want to look at it for a bit of blame and they would have said that Fianna Fáil Absolutely, we were in charge of, of the car. You and, made a car. And, how, we, and we paid the price for that. How long after the election then, in March 2011, did you 
how many days after the election did you stay around before you left Ireland? Well, I was around for a few weeks, but, you know, I was sort of tidying up my affairs in the office, moving, you know, when you, when you cease being in these jobs, you have to, there's a whole lot of files. You so have you, to, you, you did a few weeks case. and then what? Well, then I, I started travelling. I got on the plane and started looking uh, to friends that I had out there internationally. I, I travelled to Nigeria. And to was help. Ireland a place you didn't feel comfortable to be in? It's not that I didn't feel comfortable, but I just felt, you know, I, I, I have a family and, I, you know, I had, to, I had to make a living for myself and there was no point in me hanging around. There wouldn't be a flood of offers, you know, in terms of jobs. So I went out and... Did you get much grief? after the in the weeks after that election it was still tense yeah i think still people i think you know the anger's still there i mean i have to be honest about this sometimes you know i i get the odd shouted comment even when i'm abroad on on, on holidays with the family you know from in in in, in some sort of foreign places somebody what shouts something get? at you ah somebody shouts something at you you ruined the country or whatever you know so you and know. how do you feel about that well, obviously, it's not pleasant when you're with your family and stuff, but that's, you know, yeah. people are angry. And, you know, in fairness, I'm not going to complain. I have 14 years in politics and, you know, that's... You, you, know, that's you were, you were part are. of that uh, of course, government, as you course. know. And, and do, you ever, do you ever reflect on it and think that you, you might have some personal responsibility for oh, what absolutely. happened? And do you ever feel contrite or do you feel defensive? Oh, I do, I do. I feel, I feel, first of all, that we all put our eyes off the ball. I'm not talking about everybody out there. I'm talking about everybody in the government. We were probably in too long. Uh, we, in effect, Fianna Fáil were in government from 1987 onwards. There was a brief interruption when uh, John Bruton took over from Albert Reynolds yeah. for two years. And, and I suspect we were in too long. But also, I think that the boom years, I suppose, lulled us. We, we all, and I think Bertie in particular, and I, I'm not going to criticise him, I, I'm just going to make the point that, you know, a lot of people had seen an Ireland where basic minimum rates of welfare didn't exist. We all remembered the 80s and the difficulties. And there was a big kind of idealism in the government to, to make up the gap, to start spending. And, you know, to be quite honest with you, I'd be very critical of the public spending, and uh, personally and internally within the structures of the government. You know, mm. sceptical and concerned, as I was when I served in the public accounts, but at the rate of increase of spending that yeah. we were doing in health education. Did anyone shout stop? Now, it, it's terrible when you say that when you're in politics. So, I objected to spending increase in health, education, social welfare, because you know that's not a recipe mm -hmm. for popularity. But that's the reality. <laughs> you know, seventy percent of public spending goes in those mm -hmm. areas, and part of the real hostility directed at us, and of course the, this this current government, is that they are paring back. Mm -hmm. They are putting the costs back to somewhere but the which is, can be competitive. I'm not saying that with any relish. Would you love to you know? go back in time in some sense, or would you love to? Do, do you regret not standing up a little? And saying, for God's sake, this is a this is a mess. You know, why, why are we all this spending? Look at this. Do the sums, somebody. Yeah, I think some or people did. Or do you just did. roll with it? You're I think in some office. people did. And in fairness, you know, I think you need to be even-handed here. I think the interesting phenomenon here is that actually Fine Gael under John Bruton and I think Richard Bruton at the time made the point, for instance, about benchmarking, that this was something we couldn't afford, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And they were trashed electorally as a result. You know, I think Michael Noonan took over eventually. And, you know, mm. they were trashed because they were, they were actually opposing something which a lot of people were benefiting from. A lot of... Who do you think, which people now, I think, having seen what happened, would say maybe the benchmarking was, was ill-judged sure. or, or the wrong thing Who, who do. do you think, Conor, was, was a, a better T-shot? Albert, sorry, Bertie Hearn or Brian Cowan? Well, I mean, I think it, it, it's, an, it's an apples and oranges comparison. I don't well, think which I'll, one's the apple, I'll even which start one's the on that one. Well, I think, in, in fairness, uh, you know, uh, Brian Cowan inherited the situation, uh, so it's not really fair to, to... I know a lot of people have done and picked him out. Mm. Do you think uh, Bertie Hearn was a good Taoiseach? I think there's a number of things that Bertie did extremely well. I think, again, I don't want to repeat the point, but I will anyway, because I did at the beginning, is that the, the built infrastructure that was done during the boom years yeah. is still there and to the service of this country when it does, and hopefully very soon, yeah. move very steadily into recovery and, and positive growth. So that is there, yeah. and that was a good thing. And then there's a whole the bunch bad, of people watching who say, bad, we, who, people watching who say we can't eat roads. Mm. You know, it, no, no, no. It, there's no. a sense that, then, that the roads are but, great and all, but, but, but what but, about the rest? The bank but, guarantee was out of control. Yeah, it's completely yeah, ridiculous, but, but, the bank but, but, and nature of the guarantee. In fairness to Bertie, you have to be fair to Bertie, was it? The peace process was probably his greatest achievement. I think without peace in Ireland, it would be very hard 
to talk even about a lot of the multinational investors who've invested in Ireland okay. since 1990. So People neglect that and, and you know, we, did, we got some electoral benefit, I wasn't looking for one because it was for the country, but the point is that that was very groundbreaking. A whole lot of investor perceptions changed about Ireland okay. when that happened. Are you, are and, you, you know, still a member of Fianna Fáil? I'm not, I'm not, I'm living abroad and I can't be active in any political party to be quite you honest. Can't, so you can, if you and I have a personal view, to be honest which with is you. Which is what? That, then it's not fair if you're not in a country to be sort of influencing or getting involved in politics. And that's yeah. a kind of an ethical thing. I don't want to use the word ethics, but, you know, and sound prissy about that. But I, I just think if you're not in the country... What scares you, you about the word be... ethics? No, nothing scares me about it. But it, it makes... No, but it, I'm just it, curious to know I why... don't want to sound like I'm some sort of pure, saintly-like person out there, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. plying, you know. So I'm is... not a saint, by the way, just in case. So it's Russia, then, for you now? I mean, that's, what, that's your future, isn't well, it? Well, my life is there at the moment, and obviously it's a very interesting, challenging job that I'm mm. doing. It's very good to be able to work at mm. the level that I'm working at with this individual, Victor Vexenberg, and the Skoga Foundation. It's a big country, a uh, big investment. If, me, if Michael Martin called you and said, we seriously need you for this by-election, Connor, what would you say to him? I'd say, which by-election? He'd say, the one that's a sure <laughs> thing for Fianna Fáil. What would you say to him? Well, you know, I don't think there are any sure no, things for Fianna Fáil at the moment. Yeah, but you're not ruling out a return to politics here Well, Ireland. to be practical about it, I'm not living in the country. So but for I think, now, but in the yeah, future... But I, I'd never rule it out, because to be quite honest with you about it, I have no grudges or bitterness about the period, even the three years hostility, even what you heard in the programme. Yeah. I wouldn't be in Russia, I wouldn't have the position I have today were it not for, I suppose, the loyalty that people showed to me when I was involved in public service. People were very loyal to me for 14 years. Of course, their loyalty faded in the end in the third election, and rightly so. Okay. I have no complaint about that. And to be honest with you, it, it, it was a very interesting period to be alive and active in politics in Ireland. And yes, three years of it were extremely uh, difficult and challenging, but there was, I learned an awful lot of lessons there. And I think the, the lessons I learned there have served me and will serve me for life and no regrets about it but obviously yes i am contrite just to come back to that you i are. am contrite but you feel do you I feel was part of that government you feel contrite you what do you, do you are you offering an apology to the irish I, people I, I i said it many times with many of your colleagues during the period yes of course and what are you of sorry course. for well, i'm sorry that we we allowed things to slip the way they did uh, i wouldn't necessarily take the blame in relation to the banking matters, because... So you're a little I, bit sorry. I would, no, 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 I'm not a little bit, I'm genuinely sorry here. I think that the banking irresponsibility and reckless lending was everywhere. It was in the United States, the biggest economy on the planet, 35% of the world's GDP. So, you know, this was happening pretty much everywhere. Yeah. I think where we let things slip was on public spending, and we also and took the, our the eyes off the ball. No, would, no, would I, I think the issue. bank guarantee was the right thing to do, do at the time. Yeah, Even well, the, va the vastness of it? We, we had no other option. There was nobody queuing up. And the, let's remember this. People like to Couldn't talk a little about burning this in have taken place? Well, let's be clear about this. At the time of the guarantee, the ECB and the European authorities didn't actually have a legal or administrative mechanism to come to the rescue of Ireland. That happened afterwards. And the key point, I would say, is the burn the bondholders thing, a lot of people talked about it at the time. But countries who've defaulted, including the one that I now work in, Russia defaulted 20 years ago, uh, Argentina defaulted. Their experience has been a 20-year bad news situation and their repetition. It's very hard when you default as a country okay. in a sovereign terms to recover. And in, in Argentina's case, it's, uh, and Russia, it's taken 10, 20 years to rebuild any semblance of reputation okay. because of that. So, you know, I, hear that. I know I, it was populist at the time to say we should burn everybody, but maybe even burn Fianna Fáil, <laughs> burn well, down Fianna Fáil headquarters and everything. But, you know... That's not a plea, be, by the way. That's just a passing real. comment. We have, uh, to be, we, we have to be real about this. We have this, to leave it there, Conor. Thank, thank you for thanks. coming in to see us tonight. Conor Lennon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Okay.